In this video, I'm going to be talking about the development of this CNC plasma cutter. The main goal was to keep this light and portable as I don't have a dedicated workshop. This was made using aluminium extrusion, meaning the work area is really quite flexible, limited only by the size of the lengths. It features a Z probe for setting the height of the torch automatically. And the whole thing is controlled using the open source DLC32 controller, which was also used in my last project on the laser cutter. Let's get started. The first step in fabrication was to laser cut the MDF panels. This was done using 9mm material. It took two passes on the laser cutter and this image is sped up about four times I believe. The next step was to paint the panels. This was done using an emulsion paint that went on really quite thick. This is important to protect the panels against any kind of environmental effects such as warping, which MDF is known to do. It really should have been primed, but I'm hoping that the thick emulsion paint did a good job of seeing the, the panels. Time will tell. It was then time to assemble the first part of the frame. This is the Y axis using four roll wheels and a NEMA 17 stepper motor. After the two plates had been assembled, it was time to cut the frame. This is from 2040 aluminium extrusion using my trusted miter saw with a metal cutting blade. The ends were then threaded as this part is the x-axis and these threads are what joins this axis to the main part of the frame. Frame assembly came next. This is the two y-axis with the plates that were assembled previously and the whole thing held together using standard aluminium brackets. Z-axis was next and I wanted these plates to be as thin as possible to give my work envelope the maximum size it could have. So I decided to make, fabricate this out of aluminium. Now my rather wimpy 3040 router is really not very well suited to this kind of operation or I'm just really rubbish at the fees and the speeds but I lost a lot of end mills along the way. Peace be with them. I decided to peck the holes rather than drilling all the way through not just because it saved time but it was also easier on my end mills. These were the two completed z-axis plates and the next step was to drill out the holes that had been pecked earlier. Sanded off the edges and a wallop of paint meant these z-axis plates were good to go. This is the assembly of the lead screw holder which moves the z-axis down being attached to the x-axis with the NEMA motor on it with the four roller wheels which moves along the frame holding on to the z-axis. So the wheels there would move along the x-axis and the lead screw would, move, would shift the z-axis down and the roll wheels here would slide up and down the stationary part of the z-axis. And this doodad holds the linear rail for the torch holder to perform a touch off. So the plan here is the torch would touch the material, engage a limit switch, and then retract a predefined distance. The goal there being you get a consistent height with the plasma torch relative to your material. The linear rail gets added on there and then on top of that would be the, the 
limit switch. And then comes the torch holder, which would be attached to a spring. So you can imagine here the torch moving down until it hits the material and then lifting up until it hits that limit switch. And then I add the Z axis motor. So this would be driving that lead screw to move the torch holder up and down. This has to be offset with some spaces. Those are just nylon cutoffs that I had lying around, but they get the job done pretty well. Once they've been secured, I do a quick test just to see there's no binding happening. And once I'm happy, I can resume assembly. And that's the X axis being slid through with the homing switch at the end. Adding the belts is the final part of this sub assembly. They get threaded over the motor and under the wheels and fastened in with some T nuts. And the XZ sub assembly is good to go. Same step for the Y axis with the plates I made earlier, fasten down the belts. At this point, the two sub assemblies can be joined. The X axis gets bolted in with a couple of fasteners using the threads that were created earlier when the X length was cut. A quick check to make sure nothing is binding and I can move on to the most joyous part of any build, cable management. These are the chain holders that will be attached to the side of the frame. There will be two on the Y axis and one on the X axis. They're being joined using some 3D printed spaces on either side, making sure there's enough clearance between the X axis and the cable holder. This part will be holding the cable for the torch high above the frame, which allows the torch to move around without getting snagged on the rather thick cable that comes along with these plasma torches. The idea here being you can lower it and raise it and tighten it using a thumb screw. Electronics housing came next. This was made out of three mil ply, being held down by some marble weights as I got some rather wobbly stock ply material. And this is the box that will hold the control unit, which is a DLC 32, as well as an integrated screen. Once the parts were completed on the laser cutter, it was time to sand, paint and glue them together to make the structure. The sides will be glued to the bottom part of the enclosure and the top will be held in with some bolts so that it can be taken apart if any form of maintenance was needed. The first part was to glue and to paint the structure. Same thick emulsion paint that was used on the gantry plates was used on this housing. Time to add some electronics to this electronics enclosure. Starting with the on off switch, the power from that switch gets routed through to a, an e-stop, which was slightly fiddly to assemble in the end. This is the edited version, but it took a few goes to get that e-stop to bite down on the housing. The three control switches were added next, that cycle start, feed hold, and reset. The final part of this top assembly was adding the TFT screen. This was held in with four bolts and once the top assembly was complete it was a case of adding the control board to the base unit adding a fan to keep things nice and cool and then wiring everything up together 
it was a tight squeeze in the end it turned out well enough I actually ended up putting the fan on the outside rather than the inside as the depth of the switch was interfering with the fan on the inside once that little problem was solved I could give the gantry a quick test and after a bit of calibration everything was working okay Here's an overview of the main parts of the electronics for this project starting with the power coming in that's 24 volts through an e-stop and an on-off switch going into the board that blue wire is the signal for the relay which controls the torque the board sends this signal and the relay closes the connections to start the torch there's also a probe pin and that's responsible for the touch off operation. Moving along we have the hard switches, reset cycle start and feed hold. Those are standard Gerbil operations. The screen has a standard connection to the board as MakerBase make both the control board and this TFT display. Here's the connections in a table form. I will provide a link to the firmware that I used which was a modification of the stock firmware provided by MakerBase as there were some bugs in that firmware. If you have to compile from source, there were some issues regarding the screen and the board which I fixed and that will be available in the Git repo. One of the big benefits of this board is you do get an SD card input as well as Wi-Fi. Along with the USB connection, there's quite a few options on how you make the connection. I'd imagine using the SD card will be very useful to prevent any kind of interference that plasma cutters are known to generate when connecting directly via USB. I plan to experiment with the various connections but I'd imagine the SD card would be the most stable. The next part was to add a relay switch into the on off signal for the torch. I'm splicing the cable housing and adding a couple of jump headers which I can then feed into a relay switch which sits on top of the plasma torch using a 3D printed bracket. The relay allows the torch to be turned on and off via the controller rather than the physical switch on the torch. The final part of this project was to make a base stand for the machine. This could be done in a number of different ways. I had some old steel tubing lying around so I, I welded up a frame together. With the base frame complete, it was time to add the slack holders. First thing I did was attach some 2020 extrusion to the size of the frame. And then I printed out these slack holders. There must have been about 40 of them in total. And they're being held in with T-nuts, which allows me to adjust the spacing of these slats and also allows me to remove slats should I need to. So I found this to be quite a flexible solution. Spray painted everything black, added the machine which now has a, an arm for the control unit and assembled the torch onto the frame. My software workflow was to use Lightburn to produce the G-code to send to the plasma cutter. The caveat is that Lightburn does not support plasma cutters directly and I would need to run a probe or a touch-off every time a cut was performed. The touch-off being the plasma torch gets lowered down to the material, makes contact with it and then retracts a predefined distance. Here's a square and this is the standard G-code that gets produced for this square by Lightburn. We need to write a hook for this M3 command. The M3 command being the instruction that starts the torch. The solution was to write a Python script called Lighty that took as an input a standard G code file produced by Lightburn and as an output produced a custom file with the M3 and M5 commands being replaced by values you can set in a parameters file. The M3 command gets replaced with the following instructions. 
a probe, a retract, starting the torch, and then a dwell period. The dwell is useful for piercing through the materials before the cuts start. The M5 has a similar dwell period, but this is at the end of the cut. Going back to the example of the square, this would have been the regular G-code that was produced and running it through the script gave me the following G-code and this was the part that solved the issue. So the M3 replacement changing the original G-code into the values that were included in that parameters file and also a dwell time at the end for that M5 command. And a quick sidebar slash rant. I've been really, really up on Lightburn these last couple of projects. Unfortunately, they have ended Linux support, which is a big downer. My plan is to run the current version I have on Kubuntu until the wheels fall off and then see what the options are, possibly run it in a VM, see how it goes. But maybe, just maybe, they bring back support. I really hope they do. It's, it's great software. It's a shame they dropped Linux support. And this is the final contraption. There's a low cost compact air compressor, a low cost compact plasma cutter and a DIY CNC plasma machine. Space was very, very important. I found the smallest components I could. Here's the first run. This was a 20 by 20 calibration square and it turned out okay to dimension. Obviously there's some fine tuning needed. Once the square was done, it was time to try something a bit more complex. Hopefully I shall never lose this soldering iron again, which is a massive, massive problem. That's the final doodad. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.